Hello, and welcome to the Bijan Bienemann B2 IP webinar series, hosted by Bijan Bienemann. Bijan Bienemann is a boutique intellectual property law firm based out of Southeast Michigan. I'm Peter Kiros, and today my colleague Charlie Bienemann will be discussing new developments in the law of patent eligibility with a focus on Section 101. Today's webinar has been approved for CLE credit in several states. In the middle of the presentation, we will announce a polling question that will show up on your screen. If you are seeking CLE credit, please be sure to answer the question before the presentation concludes. On your screen, you will find a Q&A and chat feature. Please leave all questions in either of these boxes and we will answer them at the end. Thank you and we hope you enjoy the presentation. Okay, well thank you very much, Peter. As Peter said, today we are going to provide a little bit of an update on patent eligibility and computer-related inventions. And in fact, what I want to kind of stress at the outset is we really are providing uh, an update. I think people often think that, uh, gee, this Alice horse uh, in this 101 horse is uh, really just been beaten to death and the cases are swinging back and forth, but maybe uh, not so much is happening that's new that we need to pay attention to, but in fact, quite a bit has happened. Uh, I went back and looked. Our last monthly webinar on patent eligibility was actually just last September, uh, a mere nine months ago, and in that nine months, uh, quite a few things have happened that are worth taking note of. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Uh, one of those is the Federal Circuit's recent decision in the Berkheimer case and also the Atrix software case uh, in uh, February of this year. And then very recently, uh, the Federal Circuit denied en banc review in those cases. Uh, so we'll talk about that quite a bit. Those were the cases you may recall in which the court said, yes, of course, patent eligibility is a question of law, but it has these underlying uh, factual questions, like many questions of law, and talked a bit about what the factual predicates and what the factual evidence are uh, that need to be shown to sustain a, a 101 rejection, or in, in, the, in those cases, it was the district court's uh, invalidity determination. So we'll talk a bit about that and how that does and doesn't change practice. Uh, and also just this general trend, which as we'll see, the Patent Office has really acknowledged in some of its recent guidance that more and more claims to what you might call software per se, uh, pure software, uh, uh, you know, mere manipulation of data, to use a phrase that patent examiners often seem to like to use, uh, more and more, we're seeing claims like this survive, and that really is a relatively new trend. It seems to have accelerated uh, in 2018. We'll look at some of the cases, uh, and, and really uh, is something that you need to take note of to know how to make arguments and, and what, uh, perhaps not new, but certainly uh, more robust arguments are available now. So those are kind of the two big uh, new developments we're going to look at, and along with that, we'll look at how that's generated some new USPTO guidance and kind of how some, some new practice tips and some old practice tips uh, fall out of that. So let's uh, uh, just kind of start to establish the baseline. Uh, bear with me, because this is something everybody's probably seen countless times, but just a reminder that the law of patent eligibility is, is basically uh, court-made law. So we start with the statute, Section 101, which says here's the statutory categories, here's the things that are, uh, are patentable, and then the courts have added the, this, this limitation or these limitations that claimed invention, one, can't be an abstract idea or law of nature without, two, significantly more, some significant additional innovation. And it's really kind of on that second prong of the test that we'll spend some attention today because it's the evidence to support what is significantly more, what's not just routine, conventional, uh, that uh, some of the recent uh, case law and discussion about uh, you know, providing factual support uh, is focused on. So with that baseline, uh, I also always like to start just kind of uh, by looking at, you know, what our takeaways ultimately are going to be. And I will confess a lot of this is also not new, but worth noting and worth noting that, you know, sometimes the more things change, the more they stay the same. We're dealing with a highly subjective patent eligibility test. My take on it, I don't think I'm alone in this, what the court calls a two-part test really is kind of a, a one-part test. It, it really just kind of comes down to uh, looking at the claims, how abstract are the claims, and what can we look to in the claims that isn't abstract, 
I'm not saying that the second prong of the test altogether falls away, but I just think you'll see in a lot of cases, and we'll look at a few exceptions to this, but in a lot of cases, the second part just gets skipped or, or collapsed and, and rolled into the first part. Um, and then we've got this new development that uh, software per se, quote unquote, is more and more often surviving, but you know, a big takeaway is you know, business methods are still in a lot of trouble, obviously, and if you've got claims to steps that could be performed mentally or could be per performed manually, uh, you're probably in a lot of trouble. We'll talk a bit about the technical solution, technical problem approach, because I think more and more with respect to drafting to anticipate, uh, feel forgive uh, the expression, patent eligibility rejections uh, and to better support your, your claims for after patent issues, you really want to think about what technical problem you're solving and then provide as much support in the specification as you can for that. Um, we'll talk a bit about how to respond to rejections. Interviewing, I think, might be the most important thing in the patent prosecution process with respect to patent eligibility, but we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So just a little bit of a forecast as to where we're going. Here's kind of our overall agenda for today. We just did the introduction. Um, we're going to do a bit of a Federal Circuit update, and bear with me because there is kind of a string of cases. I have tried to select them uh, for the cases that are really relevant to where we are now, and I'm going to talk about a few of uh, kind of the old warhorse cases to get us up to date, but then we're really going to focus on some of the really recent Federal Circuit cases from the latter part of 2017 and into 2018, as I mentioned. We'll look at the new USPTO guidance that's come out and how that might impact patent prosecution and, and how to use that in patent prosecution. And then, like I said, I, I always like to end, I mean, the, the name of the game really is to figure out, you know, what's what the best practices are and what the best practices aren't and how to approach uh, patent preparation and prosecution. So we'll conclude by talking about that. And as I said, there are some uh, old lessons to be repeated, but also I think a couple of new lessons that fall out of some of the recent developments. So let's start by looking at uh, some of the, re uh, re I said recent Federal Circuit cases, and I also warn you we're going to go back to a few of the old war horses, but I'm going to try to skip through some of these pretty quickly because I know everybody's pretty familiar with them. Uh, but I'm going to start with the ultra-mercial case that uh, was one of the first cases after, maybe even the first Federal Circuit case, uh, after Alice in 2014 where uh, internet advertising claims, claims for monetizing content on the internet were held patent ineligible. And uh, this case had quite a history. It had been up and down in the Supreme Court, I think twice, kind of finally came back to the Federal Circuit and the panel said, yeah, these claims are not patent eligible. And really the notable thing in Ultramercial, uh, in, in my view, was Judge Mayer's concurrence where he said a number of things, but one of them was, look, there's no presumption uh, of eligibility. Uh, and then he also said, look, we've got a technological arts test now, kind of like if you've practiced, uh, you know, or, or instructed practice in other jurisdictions, you know, like in, in Europe, for example. Uh, that's what they've been doing for a long time. And Judge Mayer said, that's where I think uh, we are now. He said that back in 2014. And I, my thesis is, is that that's really proved out. So right after Ultramercial came the DDR Holdings case, which again, I'm, I'm stopping on just for a moment, even though it's an old case because it's been such an important one. For a long time, remember this was decided just a couple weeks after Ultramercial, for a long time, this was the only case that applicants had to point to if they were trying to say, well, these internet claims or these software claims are patent eligible because we solved this problem. Uh, I think everybody can probably chant this in unison, necessarily rooted in computer technology. And interestingly, Judge Mayer, who had made the point about the technological arts test in the ultramercial case, dissented. Basically, the issue was, were these claims directed to a, a way of manipulating and presenting web pages to preserve online branding, you know, when you had two merchants working together, a store within a store, site within a site kind of functionality. And the majority said, well, yes, because that's uh, uniquely an internet problem. And Judge Mayer, of course, uh, disagreed. But right from the outset, we had these cases that almost seemed like they couldn't be reconciled, ultra-mercial and DDR holdings. You know, one side saying, uh, an, an ultra-mercial saying, well, yeah, these claims are just saying we're abusing the internet. 
whereas uh, the, the attempt was made to distinguish DDR holdings by saying, you know, again, well, yes, they're, we're using the Internet, but we're claiming specific interactions with the Internet to get this desired result. Uh, so DDR is somehow different. Now, I put this out there, and again, I'm spending a little time to start on it because my view, which I'm not sure everybody would agree with, but I think I'm not alone, is that these cases really can't be reconciled. And that sets up the tension, illustrates the gray area in which we operate, and really just frames out a lot of the challenges that we're working under today. Excuse me. All right, so now we're going to go a little bit more quickly because I think the next few cases uh, we need to kind of mention to, again, establish our baseline, but everybody will be fairly familiar with. The Enfish case uh, basically held that this data model was patent eligible. Why? Because it improved the processing, improved the functioning of a computer, and you know, solved the technical problem. Enfish case was a big, big deal because it was really kind of the first case that came along and, and started this trend, apart from DDR Holdings, of saying that, you know, quote unquote, pure software claims can be patent eligible. But then along comes the electric power group case, and I have that uh, in the presentation, even though it's now a relatively venerable case, because it's one that, at least anecdotally, I will tell you, is cited in 101 rejections all the time. The claims were directed to basically real-time monitoring and reporting on an electric power grid, and the court uh, used this phrase that, yeah, the claims are just directed to this process of gathering and, and analyzing information and displaying the results. Well, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I have seen this in many, many uh, office actions quoted by many, many examiners, and I mention it uh, because it's a case that you can often distinguish. The electric power group claims, if you go look at the case, really were just directed to gathering data and reporting it. It really was just a reporting application, but it does not stand for the proposition that all claims that are directed to data processing, witness NFISH, witness the McRow case that we'll see in, in uh, the next slide, it does not stand for the proposition that all claims directed to data processing are patent ineligible. So this is a case to very much be aware of, and when you see it cited in an office action, it's kind of a flag to really go look and see if it's applicable because, uh, again, this is anecdotal, but nine times out of ten, it really isn't. And, and this is also a case, you know, starting with NFISH, we really saw, you know, technical uh, solution can save you. Uh, but what we'll see in a number of cases is the courts will say a technical environment can't. That's not enough. You have to have a technical solution or a technical improvement to that technical environment. So shortly after NFISH and Electric Power Group, these cases were all kind of bunched together, came the McRow case. Again, I think folks are fairly familiar with it, so I won't spend a ton of time on it, but it was a computer program for automating uh, a process of synchronizing lips of animated characters to what was going on um, with the audio stream. And the court said, well, there's some specific rules here, and those specific rules don't really relate to the manual process. It's not just automating what an artist did, but there's specific rules that an artist you know, couldn't and wouldn't have implemented, so there's an improved technological result. So McRow also, I think, is a very, very important case to look at when you have these, these types of, of claims in your case that uh, you know, are maybe related to automating a manual process, but, but do more than that, that, that really do something that could not have been done manually. Uh, the Bascom case, we also need to take a look at, uh, skipping back in time just a little bit, because the Bascom case, which ironically I see, and you'll see this in a later slide, I, I've seen this case cited a lot for the, proposition, for the proposition that claims are directed to an abstract idea and therefore are patent ineligible. The case is notable because it's a case where the court explicitly said, yes, the claims are directed to an abstract idea, but turn to the second prong of the test and the claims are saved because there's uh, significantly more going on. Yeah, there's generic computing technology and, and an abstract uh, idea, but there's also more than that because of the way in which uh, the claim talks about filtering internet content and uh, achieving its result, and that result improves a computer's performance. I would also say that this case, I think, supports my thesis that our quote-unquote two-part test is really a one-part test, but uh, in any event, 
Uh, certainly, if you're looking for examples of you know, how the two parts of the test can be broken out, uh, the, the Bascom case is one of the few explicit examples you can find. All right, moving forward a little bit now, uh, the Thales case uh, is a case that you want to look at if you're claiming some hardware environment and the uh, examiner says, well, the claims aren't really uh, directed to uh, hardware, they're just directed to generic hardware with some kind of improvement in Thales. Uh, I'll skip back here. The claims were directed to this inertial tracking system and talked about how the different parts of the inertial tracking system work together. And the court said, yeah, there's just an abstract idea of inertial tracking, but the Federal Circuit said, well, there's more than that. They're not just claiming mathematical equations, but there's a specific structure that interacts with respect to those and provides an improvement based on the claim structure, and so the claims are patent eligible. Um, so certainly worth looking at if you've got hardware elements and you can make the argument that it's the arrangement and interaction of the hardware elements, not just the, the mathematical algorithm that you're relying on. Uh, the Recognicorp case uh, is worth looking at because if you look at my last bullet here, um, claims analogous to old manual processes are definitely in trouble. Here the claim was directed to taking data out of an image, extracting it, encoding it according to certain rules, and the court said, well, you know, look, this is just the abstract idea of encoding and decoding data. So it's not patent eligible, it's just this old manual process that's given this new application, but the technical parts are, are all, uh, you know, just generic stuff. So here, and this is an important uh, note about how the case was distinguished from ENFISH, in ENFISH, computer processing was improved. Here, computer processing was just a tool to implement this old manual process. So another uh, pointer is that this case certainly provides is uh, really try to figure out how you can move your case away from just being directed to automating an old manual process. I mean, if you contrast, for example, Recognicorp with the McRow case that we just talked about, uh, you know, that's the difference you want to make. You want to be on the side of McRow and having some, some new technical rules as opposed to just automating the old manual process, which is how the court saw things here in the Recognicorp case. All right, so now we are going to move into really kind of some of the more recent stuff, which I uh, promised you we wouldn't just rehash old law. Um, so the visual memory case now, uh, so we're getting uh, well within the last year. The visual memory case dealt with uh, what looks like a really kind of broad and, dare I say it, abstract claim. Most of the claim you'll see is a preamble Pretty simple claim, uh, a memory, a bus, a cache, all pretty generic conventional parts of uh, computer architecture. And then the last limitation of the claim just talked about how this programmable operational uh, characteristic uh, was going to govern storage of data. Basically, you're categorizing data to figure out how to store it in a cache. That sure sounds like an abstract idea. That's certainly what the uh, accused infringer said in this case, uh, Judge Hughes in dissent certainly agreed with that, but the majority said, well, no, it's not just about hardware, and we might, you know, harken back to the uh, Thales case that we just looked at. It's not just about hardware, it's about how the hardware is configured. The claim isn't just directed to an abstract black box, but um, unlike what the dissent said, it's not just that the innovation was programming to implement an abstract idea, it's that there's an actual improvement to a memory system that is achieved by the configuration recited in the claim. Now, I think the court was, as you'll see the kind of the three uh, points that the majority relied on, the first of those is there was computer code in, in an appendix. So I think the court was influenced by the fact that there was a lot of technical detail, there was a lot of technical uh, explanation. Uh, it wasn't like uh, the, the patent specification just said, yeah, we're going to do this functionality. They actually backed it up with the te technical detail of how they did it and how they achieved an, an improvement. So the lesson is, um, yeah, first, as I say, these cases can go either way and this was a split panel, and you could certainly see this case going uh, a, a different way. Uh, but uh, 
The other lesson is the more technical detail you have in your spec that you can then argue from, either to an examiner or to a district judge, uh, the better off you're going to be and really explicitly explain how that technical detail is tied to your claims and how that technical detail is encompassed in your claims to get some technical improvement. The secured mail case uh, I've included really because it's a fairly recent case and we should just take note of it, but I think this is a case, and it's good to have an example like this, of uh, a case that's pretty clearly at one end of the patent eligibility spectrum. You know, as I said at the beginning, as I've been saying throughout, uh, certainly there's a lot of gray area and a lot of subjectivity, but there are also some cases you can look at and, and predict the result with a fair amount of uh, certitude and certainly not be surprised at the result where, as here, uh, there were seven patents. Uh, I've got an exemplary or some exemplary claim language quoted here, but basically the patents were all about how you sent electronic mail and electronic messages and affixed various uh, 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 stamps or uh, markings or objects to them when you sent them. So it was pretty easy for the court to say, look, you know, email is analogous to snail mail and you know, putting a marking, putting a postmark or a stamp outside a mail object to, to communicate something, hey, I paid for this, I mailed it from you know, downtown Detroit, uh, whatever it's going to be, uh, that's all pretty abstract uh, stuff and there's no inventive concept on you know, submitting it or submitting the, the mail item to be mailed or putting information on it. Uh, there, there's just use of, of kind of conventional and existing technology in a, in a certain way that's really analogous to what's been going on for centuries. So like I said, I think this is kind of just a classic example of having a technical environment is not going to save the day to you, for you and if you look at the claim and it's just really analogous to you know, fundamental human practices and, and you can't really argue that there's a technical improvement, it's just you've applied this in a technical environment, uh, that's where uh, I, I think claims are, are in trouble and you know, we can at least say that, again, at, at one end of the spectrum, I, I think there is some predictability. So now we're going to get into uh, some really recent cases. Uh, I promised you we would uh, be keeping it fresh. So I wanted to just kind of start uh, that by uh, looking at a couple of claims in isolation, you know, I've been making the point, I just made the point that some claims you can look at and, and really know how they're going to come out, but I've been making the point with respect to a lot of these cases that you look at the claims and you really can't tell uh, just from reading the claim how they're going to come out. So I thought it would be kind of fun to, to try that with uh, two patent claims here and then we'll talk about the cases, the Federal Circuit cases, where these claims were evaluated for patent eligibility. Uh, the one on the left, the 476 patent, and you've got a display, you put up a menu that lists a bunch of apps and you've got some information about the apps to allow a user to uh, better select uh, the app that they want to select. That's the 476 patent. And then on the right, we've got the 187 patent that uh, talks about transmitting message packets over a network and there are all these steps about you know, how the packets are, are received and you know, a stream is converted and then it's routed. We control it you know, based on some signals that we get uh, and then we monitor what's going on to you know, see what's going on actually uh, you know, in our system. Uh, with respect to these packets that uh, as, as they get received and, and what's done with them. So that's the 187 patent. So get in your head which of these, I'll, I'll give a little hint, one of these uh, things is not like the other, one of these things is patent eligible and one of them isn't. And in fact the claim that was held uh, patent ineligible may surprise you. Uh, the two-way media case from November of last year uh, was the, the uh, case where the uh, patent claimed this method for transmitting packets and the court said, well, you know, yeah, it looks kind of technical, but you dig into it and remember each of the steps of the claim talked about converting, routing, controlling, and monitoring and the court uh, homed in on that and said, well, that's just functional stuff. The claim doesn't actually talk about how it achieves its results in a non-abstract way. It just kind of recites these functional steps and leaves it at that. And yeah, the claim talked about a technical architecture, but or the, I'm sorry, the patent specification talked about a technical architecture, but it really didn't claim that. It just kind of um, 
just kind of disclosed it and, and didn't really uh, claim any improvements to it. And yeah, the patent owner talked about solving these technical problems, but the claim just had this generic functional language, and we can't tie what the claim was doing to actually solving these uh, purported uh, technical problems that are being solved. So the claim uh, went down in this case. On the other hand, the core wireless case, which is a case we'll mention a couple times, uh, the claim survived. Remember, those are the claims drawn to uh, displaying some menu items on a screen. And those claims survived. The court looked at NFISH and visual memory, which is one reason why I wanted to touch on those cases before we got to some of the more recent cases. Uh, and also the Fingen case, which had been decided a little uh, earlier and we'll look at actually on the next slide. Uh, and relied on all those cases. All those cases were cases where uh, there was kind of pure software being claimed, uh, just kind of pure manipulation of data, call it what you will. Uh, but the court looked at those cases and said, well, the core wireless claims are kind of like that uh, because the claims um, aren't just talking about, you know, generic summaries of information, but there's a particular way of doing it, and there's a particular way of doing it in electronic devices, and that's what's being claimed. I don't think they cited the McRow case here, but actually that's kind of the argument of McRow. So McRow and Core Wireless are two good cases to think about if you are saying, yeah, I've got something that seems analogous to a manual method, but uh, you know, I've got some special rules or a special way of doing it that's unique or particular to the machine. Um, the claims improve the user interface, and I find this interesting because it's not that they made the computer work faster, it's not that they made the computer processing more efficient, it's just an improved user interface for electronic devices that doesn't have any manual analog, uh, obviously, but at the same time, it's also not an improvement to the machine itself, it's an improvement to what's being presented to a user. So this case goes pretty far in what it finds as support for patent eligibility in terms of a technical solution. Again, you're gonna think I'm a broken record, but this can't be repeated enough, uh, more and more, the cases are really emphasizing having something in the patent specification that talks about the improved result that's achieved by what you're claiming, just tying it together. And, and the, here, the improvements you might not think of, as, as I was saying a moment ago, that technical, scrolling and switching views, um, you know, improving device efficiency because the menu is better organized, those were the technical improvements that saved the day here. So the Fingen case, uh, as I said, was actually a few weeks before Core Wireless. Um, I just wanted to contrast Core Wireless and two-way media, so I took things a little out of order. But uh, the Fingen case is also pretty important. You look at this claim. It's a method claim. It seems pretty broad. It's talking about, you know, getting a, a downloadable, a downloadable file, and then uh, getting a security profile for that. Um, because you want to find suspicious code. So, you know, you're doing some virus scanning. That all seems like pretty old, well-known, kind of abstract, generic stuff. And then you just link the, um, link the security profile to the downloadable um, before you make the downloadable available to your web clients. Well, of course you want to do that because you, you want to get that virus uh, uh, out of there. You don't want that virus to be downloaded to your, to your clients. And how do you do that? Well, you do a security analysis on it. But the court said, wow, this claim is not abstract because there's specific steps about the security, security profile and identifying suspicious code, linking it to the downloadable uh, file to get you this improved result. The improvement, well, it's this new kind of file, this downloadable security profile that lets the computer security system do things it couldn't do before. What couldn't it do before? Well, apparently it couldn't link these files to these profiles, to these files, to uh, do the security scan. That was what uh, saved the day in Fingen. So I would propose that, uh, you know, again, if you have a uh, claim to just kind of, you know, analyzing uh, data and doing something, this is a pretty broad result. This is pretty broad support for patent eligibility of a claim like that. Again, if you can say, hey, there's something being done in the technical environment that really is a technical solution because it's something new. It's something that hasn't been done before. Now we'll talk, you've probably already heard, we'll talk a little bit more in a moment. This doesn't mean that patent eligibility and prior art analysis are at all the same, but it does mean if you can 
point to an improved technical step that you know you can say this is new and improved it's technical uh, there's some pretty pretty broad uh, pretty broad claims that can still pass muster so now we're getting into the the really really recent stuff I think the stuff that has a lot of currency and that we really want to think about I know a lot of people have been thinking about in terms of how practice is affected uh, the Berkheimer case was decided by the Federal Circuit in February of this year and it's interesting for actually a couple reasons uh, one of which has gotten a lot of press and that's the question of the factual component uh, to a 101 analysis um, let's just start by looking at the claims uh, the claims are directed to we've got independent claim one and then there were also some dependent claims at issue so I've got uh, an example of the dependent claims here that claim four as well uh, but the claims that were at issue dealt with uh, uh, basically parsing an item and evaluating it so you could figure out uh, how to store it. And claim four um, recites some additional detail about how this object is going to be stored. So like I said, the Berkheimer case is uh, responsible for a couple of things uh, or interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, uh, and this isn't what got so much attention, but when I first read it, I looked at the fact that the court separated claim one and claim four, or actually uh, claims four through seven, uh, which were dependent claims, from claim one for purposes of patent eligibility analysis. This might not seem uh, that controversial or surprising. Certainly, it's always been the law that you need to look at each claim uh, on its own merits for you know, any invalidity analysis, uh, but certainly one-on-one analysis. But often, uh, the reason why this caught my interest is because often when you're prosecuting a software patent application, the examiner will just say, well, claims 1 through 21 are patent ineligible because they're all directed to the abstract idea of processing data. We're going to talk uh, a bit in a moment when we get to you know, some of the best practices uh, about the need to really hold the examiner's feet to the fire to make sure that the prima facie case of patent ineligibility has been stated but one basic thing is to address each and every claim and address the claim separately. And what the Federal Circuit said here is, well, look, all the claims don't rise and fall together. Claim four has some additional things in it, and, uh, and claims four through seven have some additional things in it and need to be uh, considered separately. So uh, that's one kind of important thing about the Berkheimer case that I did just want to stop on. But the big, big thing was this statement in the second bullet on this slide that yeah, patent eligibility is a question of law, but there's some uh, underlying factual questions. And in this case, the district court should have looked at those, and, and it didn't, uh, said Judge Moore, who wrote the opinion here. And the court said, look, the factual question is this, whether something is well understood, routine, and conventional at the time of the patent. Now, as we'll see, this doesn't necessarily mean was it shown in the prior art. It's a different inquiry, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But when this case was handed down, it kind of created a uh, or generated a lot of attention because people have been thinking, well, patent eligibility is a question of law. Are there factual questions? Well, maybe, maybe not, uh, but we're sure not getting into a detailed uh, factual inquiry. Now, again, as we'll see in a moment, that's not quite true. I think kind of the factual component has, has been there all along, but nonetheless, it's got an awful lot of uh, attention from folks. I will also say that, you know, I think it's a fairly non-controversial statement. You know, we all learned this in the first year of law school that questions of law, well, there are always underlying questions of fact. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, this is something that, as we'll see, uh, has generated a, a bit of controversy, co excuse me, controversy and concern. I think ultimately, uh, maybe some of that has been a little overstated, but uh, we will see. So that was Berkheimer, and then a week later, along comes the Atrix software case, uh, in an opinion also authored by Judge Moore. The claims in Atrix software were directed to uh, basically uh, systems for uh, putting data into a viewable form. So that's certainly something that's on its face. You read that and you think, well, that could be susceptible to a 101 challenge. The district court had held the claims uh, ineligible on a Rule 12b6 motion, 
And it had done so on two grounds, and one of those is, is worth looking at, and then we'll kind of get to the meat of the matter, and that is this ruling that a claim was ineligible is directed to intangible subject matter, basically saying, well, the claim just isn't statutory, it's directed to intangible uh, matter. And what the majority said there was, well, for that claim where the court reached that conclusion, that was erroneous because you've got to do the Alice Mayo analysis. The intangible matter uh, grounds for invalidity or uh, grounds for uh, a rejection by an examiner is actually very narrow. Uh, it pertains to when you're claiming something like you know, a transitory medium. Uh, folks may be familiar with the Knighton case, uh, N-U-I-J-T-E-N, that said, look, if you're claiming a, a transitory medium, a signal medium, that's not patent eligible. And if you've got that kind of claim, then you can get this kind of rejection or this kind of uh, invalidity holding as it was in this case, but otherwise you really need to do the Alice Mayo analysis. I'm dwelling on this a little bit because you do see sometimes in office actions the examiner will just say, uh, oh, well, the claim's just uh, not directed to tangible subject matter, it's patent ineligible. Now, you don't see that very often, but I have seen it. I do mention it. Uh, we'll talk more about looking at has the examiner made a prima facie case and properly set forth the rejection? And part of that is looking at, did the examiner actually do the Alice Mayo test or did they just say, hey, the claims are directed to intangible or ineligible subject matter? So now getting to the patent eligibility question, um, like I said, it was a 12B6 dismissal and that did play into things here because the majority was able to say, well, look, on, on a Rule 12 motion, you need to view the uh, facts in the light most favorable to the non-movement, non-movement, and here the patent owner in, in its complaint had pled facts about how there was a technical improvement that if those facts were true, uh, then they would survive an Alice uh, question. So while patent eligibility is a question of law, just like Berkheimer said, repeated here, there are subsidiary fact questions that have to be resolved. We can't make the legal determination until those are. And so this is a case that can't be decided on a Rule 12 basis. Judge Ryan, of course, dissented, uh, and he also uh, kind of expressed these same views again when these uh, Atrix and Berkheimer were considered on bonk, as we'll see in a moment. Um, but basically, I think Judge Ryan's concern was that Pandora's box could be opened here. The majority is trying to, uh, as he put it, shoehorn a significant factual component into the patent eligibility analysis. And look, if we're doing that, well, there's all sorts of extrinsic evidence, prior art, experts, publications, all sorts of stuff that could come in and all of a sudden be on the table. And, you know, that's just kind of a, a logistical nightmare to sort all that out. Um, so that's the, the concern, and I think other people uh, had that concern, or maybe in some cases that hope uh, as well. We need to think about how that's really going to um, play out. So before I get to the en banc consideration of Atrix and Berkheimer, which I will in a moment, I, I just want to point out a, a couple of cases where expert testimony or you know, factual evidence was offered. and. I'm not so sure it really uh, swayed the day. So the Intellectual Ventures, uh, the Symantec case came about a month after Berkheimer and Atrix and the patent owner had uh, seen those cases and, and flagged for the court, uh, you know, hey, Berkheimer means you gotta remand, reverse and remand because there's some fact questions that need to be decided here and uh, those weren't considered. And the court said, well, no, actually we can look at this and see that the district court did in fact you know, make findings of fact and had uh, detailed findings. We can see there was no inventive concept here. So, um, you know, we're still okay, uh, even under part two of the Alice Mayo test. Um, and then the court said, look, there was no evidence to show that there was any unconventional order of, of claim steps. And they, they noted intellectual ventures could have put in expert testimony, but they didn't. So, to me, this kind of immediately dials back on, on the dissent in the Atrix case that we just looked at, just kind of noting that, well, the, these factual questions have kind of been on the table all along, and we're going to see that also in these next two cases. These factual issues and questions have kind of been on the table all along, and we're not really shaking things up by explicitly 
noting that. And again, I'm not sure everybody agrees with that, but that's kind of my uh, take on all of this so far. So the two cases I've put up here, one's from the Eastern District of Texas, and one is from uh, the Federal Circuit just before uh, Berkheimer was decided, actually, but both of these are before Berkheimer, where expert testimony had gone in and uh, it wasn't enough to save the day. In the image processing case, there, and if you go look at the claims, I mean, there's some you know, complicated statistical processing going on, and the, expert, and the expert said, hey, this is really an innovative statistical technique, and the court said, well, it doesn't matter because we can analogize it to uh, a manual process. You could do this mentally or with pen and paper, and so the expert uh, declaration is not gonna swing the day. And in the MOVE case, um, the expert just offered this conclusory declaration, declaration trying to put in some evidence saying, hey, there's something uh, uh, not that's a really a new inventive concept here. And then the court said, well, that doesn't, that doesn't matter because it's abstract and it's just abstract. So just I realize these are kind of isolated examples, but just looking at examples like this, we can see that uh, you know, the, the factual requirements have been out there all along. So the Federal Circuit did decline to review Berkheimer and Atrix en banc uh, for the Seinfeld fans out there, no en banc for you. And basically it's a, a kind of a rehash of what we've already talked about. I think maybe the most notable thing here was Judge Lurie's uh, concurrence that Judge Newman joined uh, in Berkheimer saying, you know, look, this is kind of a mess. We need clarification by higher authority, which might be Congress, because we've just got all these uh, 101 problems that are twisting us in knots and nobody really knows the answer and these things need to get resolved. And to which I personally say, here, here. And I think a lot of people would join me. Otherwise, Judge Moore kind of uh, put in her concurring opinion what had already been said in the, Ber uh, the Berkheimer and Atrix panel decisions. Um, you know, if there's a question of law with underlying questions of fact, what's well understood, routine and conventional. And Judge Reina kind of repeated his dissent uh, in Atrix saying, look, this is really new. This is a change of precedent. Now we've got all these factual questions. Pandora's box is kind of open. What's gonna happen here? You know, one-on-one -on -one analysis ought to be like contract interpretation. You don't look beyond the four corners of the patent unless, you know, there's kind of a parole evidence rule for uh, patent eligibility analysis and Pandora's box is really open. Like I said, I'm not sure that it is, but uh, that's certainly the concern and what we're kind of watching unfold. So let's now look at some of the USPTO guidance that's come out. I just put in here uh, the flow chart that probably everybody's seen countless times, just as a reminder for the analysis and the tasks that examiners officially follow. Step one of the PTO's test is actually, you know, is the claim statutory? Does it fall into one of those statutory classes? And then what the PTO calls 2A and 2B are really parts one and two of the Alice Mayo test that we've been talking about. And as I mentioned before, you really want to pay attention to, you know, what part the examiner is labeling and what the examiner is talking about to make sure you know, A, what you're arguing against, but B, has the examiner actually stated a prima facie, stated a proper rejection? So just something to keep in mind. The USPTO has uh, the subject matter eligibility page, which is really a great resource. Uh, they put the recent guidance up, examiner training, uh, and then they've got this chart of subject matter eligibility uh, decisions, which I really commend your attention to because uh, they've got pretty much every Federal Circuit uh, case in there that's relevant. They update it, I think, on a monthly basis. They've got some of the older Supreme Court cases. You can sort it by, you know, what's presidential, non-presidential. They've got a brief summary of what the subject matter was. Um, you can, you know, sort it by date. It's uh, just a really good resource. When I have a rejection, I often just go to this chart uh, to look at, you know, what are the cases that are out there that might be close going one way or the other to my case that, uh, you know, I need to address. And a lot of times, you know, the examiner, will, I mentioned before, will give you the old electric power group rejection, and you'll think, well, yes, I am just processing data, but I'm doing a lot more in electric power group. And you go to this chart and you pull out um, McRow or, you know, some other case that's a lot closer uh, to what you're doing, especially some of those recent, you know, FinGen core wireless um, uh, cases from earlier this year that uh, are really worth looking at. So just know these resources are there and don't forget to use them. 
So the USPTO has offered guidance on, on Berkheimer as well as Fingen and Core Wireless, which came a little earlier. And there are some interesting statements here. You know, the PTO is now looking at these cases and I'm saying, yeah, we need to acknowledge this trend. I told you at the beginning, one of the big uh, takeaways uh, from today's presentation, one of the big updates, I think, is that software-based innovations can be non-abstract and can be patent eligible. Um, you know, Fingen and Core Wireless, the PTO's memo summarizes both of those. I've got the link to the memo at the bottom of the slide here. And then they said, look, these decisions show a claim reciting a software-related invention may not be directed to an abstract idea. And I think it's kind of e interesting how they phrase that because it almost suggests the presumption is that these claims still are directed to an abstract idea. So, you know, we can quibble about uh, uh, how this is couched. But nonetheless, this is kind of a significant directive to examiners that uh, I, think, um, I think was missing before. And then on Berkheimer, the significant thing, I didn't really cover this in detail when we talked about Berkheimer because I knew it was coming here. The PTO laid out, you know, what, what is the evidence that an examiner can consider? So this memo is worth looking at and thinking about for that reason. You, know, you can make admissions just like you can in your spec or during prosecution, just like you can with respect to prior art. You can get a court decision, or the examiner can get a court decision saying, hey, the court has found this particular element to be routine or conventional. But note, as the PTO said, it's really got to be the same element. So that's something to look at because examiners might kind of try to stretch what a court decision said to fit your claim, and your claim really isn't claiming the element that was at issue in the court decision. So that's something to really uh, focus on. Publications can be evidence of common use, but it's important to note that just because it qualifies as prior art under Section 102 does not mean that it establishes routine, well-understood conventional activity for purposes of the ALICE test. Very important point and something that I imagine we're going to be talking to examiners about a bit in the months to come. And then uh, finally, official notice, just again, like with prior art, the examiner can take official notice and you can challenge it and go through that whole routine. So I promised some practice tips, and um, I will uh, kind of run through some of these uh, that have been presented previously that folks are probably familiar with or that we've already talked about in the presentation uh, a little quickly and then focus really on kind of some of the new arguments that you can make in um, arguing rejections that I think are available based on the new cases and based especially on the, you know, the guidance from the, the Berkheimer and, and to a lesser but significant extent, the memo on Fingen and Core Wireless. So um, I've mentioned the problem-solution approach, problem-solution approach, uh, state a technical solution, show how you achieve that, tie your claims to it. I don't think we need to say more now. Um, I always like to emphasize to folks, yes, the law says generic computing technology can be a real problem in terms of supporting patent eligibility, but nonetheless, I think in your claims you still want to talk about generic computing technology because other claims will get you into trouble under the Williamson v. Citrix uh, 112 case, if folks are familiar with that, but they also cause you big problems under ALICE because if you use an abstract term, it's a lot easier to say your claim is abstract, which is why you really want to be clear about what you're talking about. I think this is a good practice tip for other reasons. A lot of people don't like to t define claim terms out of concern for uh, creating uh, you know, some kind of uh, limiting scope on claims or you know, tying up the litigators later, but certainly when you're talking about terms that could be construed very broadly, you want to make sure that they've got a technical definition underlying them. Detailed process descriptions. Spell out your technical solution. I don't think I need to say more about this now, but it's a very important point. And now let's talk a little bit about, I think, some of the specific lessons that do fall out of uh, <clears throat> the recent developments, and especially Berkheimer. We'll talk about, you know, what goes into a prima facie case and making sure the examiner has made the prima facie case. I think that's way more important here in the 101 realm than it is, say, with uh, you know, 102, 103, 112 making sure the examiner cited really relevant legal authority, because a lot of times they'll crank out boilerplate. Uh, my old friend, Electric Power Group, 
and the case they've cited probably isn't really relevant to your claim, and this is a realm where the facts need to match pretty closely for the precedent to apply. Always looking at the technical improvement and then interviewing, interviewing, interviewing is so important. So with respect to a prima facie case, make sure the examiner, first of all, you know what parts of the test, uh, the patent eligibility test the examiner is addressing, as I said before. And then look at, you know, has the examiner really addressed all the claim elements? Have they just stated a broad abstract idea or have they really accounted for all your claim elements? Because a lot of times I'll see, uh, well, the claims are just directed to the abstract idea of processing data without significantly more. Well, there's a lot more in the claim. And so you need to really address that up front. And then look at, okay, the examiner is saying, well, this is just a well-understood fundamental conventional activity. Well, I think even before, but now the examiner needs to, going back to that Berkheimer memo, the examiner needs to tell you what the factual evidence is, kind of like in a 103 rejection where sometimes we don't always make the examiner be as rigorous about you know, factual support as uh, we should maybe. Here, it's really, really important to make the examiner provide that factual support, spell out what it is so you can address it and so you can provide uh, counter evidence as appropriate or point out how the factual support isn't relevant. I have here that you know 101 and 103 are creeping closer together because I do think that's true, but at the same time, and as the Berkheimer, USPTO's Berkheimer memo pointed out, they really are different analyses and you should not let the examiner conflate prior art with uh, 101 uh, eligibility. So just some details that you really want to focus on in addressing 101 rejections. I want to dwell on this a little bit more, just making sure that you've really got relevant legal authority. Again, the facts really need to match or you can distinguish them. And remember that, uh, you know, again, that chart of decisions I pointed out, you really want to go look, find the case that really is closest to your facts and have that be the relevant pertinent legal authority, not the case that the examiner has kicked out in uh, some, some boilerplate. Also, make sure that what the examiner cited actually is precedential. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, but I've seen it happen, and you definitely would want to call that out if a non-precedential case was cited, because what the PTO's guidance says on that, it, I think rightly, is that while the examiner can cite a case that's not precedential, but it has to be really, really, really close, you know, just pretty much identically match uh, the claim at issue. We talked a lot about the technical improvement uh, and arguing a technical improvement. I have this slide in just to emphasize that it's a really big part of arguing rejections, showing what the technical improvement is and how you achieve that. You know, you may persuade an examiner with this, but certainly if you're uh, going to appeal, uh, these are things that you want to have spelled out and, and really arguments that you want to have set down. Look at whether your claims uh, recite a technical structure, so then you can argue, hey, the technical structure is right there in the claim, and the specification supports that, that the technical improvement is achieved. And I think these arguments have a lot more currency now, especially in light of you know, the recent cases, FinGen, Core Wireless, and so forth, uh, and examiners are going to have to pay more attention. But uh, you know, thus far, thus far uh, you know, the technical improvement argument is not one that I at least have always found to be effective with examiners, but I think you need to make it, and I think it's going to gain more and more currency as, as uh, time moves on if the trends continue. Interviewing is so important, and I emphasize this because a lot of times, uh, you know, people don't interview, or especially, I think you should always interview, frankly, no matter what kind of rejection you have, uh, almost always that is, but in a 101 rejection, you just don't always know because things are so subjective and different art units, quite frankly, certainly different tech centers can approach things differently within the PTO. So you really need to talk to the examiner and see you know, what the basis for the rejection is and what the examiner thinks might cure the rejection. Occasionally you'll get, uh, you know, you'll run into a stone wall and the examiner makes clear that just no way, no how based on uh, the subject matter in this spec, are you going to get these claims through? And then you need to think about whether you're going to appeal. Of course, the appeal statistics are not very good, and I've done a lot of looking. They're, they're kind of hard to gather, but a number of people have, have done the work. And uh, one statistic I found for computer-related inventions, and this is fairly recent, um, was an 80% affirmance rate 
uh, on 101 rejections for computer inventions. That's not very good. I think some of that is just due to what's in the pipeline and, and people having filed things that there's no other way to keep them alive other than to appeal. Uh, so maybe we'll see these rates get better also as people figure out more what they can and cannot appeal. Uh, but sometimes, you know, nonetheless, that's, you know, the examiner is not going to let the claim through and it's, you know, you, you do think you have a good argument and I've had a few cases like that. You need to appeal, just be aware the PTAB can always enter new grounds of rejection or enter a new rejection sua sponte. So you need to watch out for that and think about, you know, really just making the argument on the merits, not necessarily what the examiner said. But I also have anecdotally seen some cases where the examiner didn't state a prima facie case, and, and that was, in fact, persuasive, which goes back to the point about when you're arguing the rejections, make sure the examiner really has made the prima facie case, and um, then point that out to the PTAB uh, if you do need to appeal. So that reaches the end of the matter I had prepared. Uh, you can enter questions through either the uh, chat uh, window. Um, and uh, I see we've got a couple questions. So either through the Q&A window or the chat window, I think. Um, so I see we've got a couple of questions. So I'm going to take a moment to look at those and then feel free to submit uh, more questions if you, um, if you have any. Um. So one question is whether the specification should explicitly describe a technical solution. I, I think the question is, um, and then what evidence can be relied on in front of the P examiner or the PTAB if it's not in the specification. So it's really kind of uh, two questions. So the first question, should the specification explicitly describe a technical solution to a technical problem? Uh, my answer to that in many cases is yes, but that's a controversial answer because a lot of people are afraid of their claims being limited to whatever the technical solution is they explicitly state. So we certainly uh, don't do it in every case and in a lot of cases, or really in all cases, what you should do is explicitly state what the solution is, explicitly state that there's a technical improvement, even if you don't say, and a lot of times you won't want to say this, there's a technical problem which is X and my technical solution is Y. But what you do want to say is you don't want to have Y, your technical solution, in the spec talking about, hey, I implement this functionality, I implement these steps, and I get this technical benefit out of it, so that when you claim those steps, you've got the specification talking about the technical benefit and you can point back to it. And then the second part to the, that question is, um, the second part to that question is what evidence can you rely on? And the answer is, I think actually this is where Berkheimer is helpful and kind of lays that out. And what Berkheimer says is, um, and the PTO's memo on that again is, um, you know, you can have official notice, you can have uh, printed publications, you can have cases, um, you know, or you can have, uh, you know, some other kind of evidence. So you could, for example, put in a declaration. Uh, I don't think you would want to do that because, you know, it's probably not something you want in your file history. I, I did have that, I think, on the slide where I, I talked about the kinds of evidence you could submit. Uh, but I think the PTAB is going to rely on whatever you can properly put in front of the examiner and what you can properly put in front of the examiner, or what the examiner really ought to start by putting in front of you, uh, are the kinds of things that that memo talks about. Um, so I am not uh, seeing, I do see one question um, uh, wanting a um, uh, wanting a uh, copy of the presentation, and that will all be up on our website. And if you email me, I'm happy to uh, uh, email it to you. My email address is my last name, Beneman, which you see on this slide here, at b2iplaw.com. My email address is uh, here on the top of the slide. So if you do have questions or want to get the materials, please feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, otherwise, um, we have one more question, which is, uh, and I'll start by saying I already know, I don't totally know the answer to this question, but it's an interesting one to think about, which is exactly kind of why do we have this new trend of a lot of computer-based claims 
being found patent eligible and, uh, you know, are things uh, getting better in terms of applicants writing claims or, or is there really a change in views on patent eligibility? Uh, I think it's probably all of those things. I think the cases that are getting litigated and certainly making their way to the federal circuit, you know, a lot of those are still claims that uh, were written, you know, well before Alice, uh, really well before the 2010 Bilski case in some cases. So there is some catch up that, that has to take place. These things all really, really lag. And certainly also in the way that, you know, rejections and, and statistics and trends that the PTO are coming out, I think would be reflective of that. It takes a little while for, you know, what we're filing and how we're practicing to catch up with the most recent pronouncements. Uh, and I would also say, you know, clearly the Federal Circuit is, is just struggling to find its way. And, you know, Judge Lurie's concurrence in that uh, en banc uh, Berkheimer decision, I think really highlights that that, you know, we just need more clarity. And as we look at these cases, um, you know, we don't want to say everything is, is uh, patent ineligible. Clearly, under the law, not everything is patent eligible. And it's trying to find that, I won't say happy medium, but, you know, find, find that uh, more clear medium that is the real challenge. So I, I think the question that was asked is a very interesting one to think about. Uh, I think there are a number of different answers and, and perhaps no uh, incredibly clear answer. So uh, that looks like the extent of the questions, and uh, I think we're about out of time, so I will turn it back over to Peter to wrap things up. Thank you for joining us today's uh, Bijan Bienemann BGIP webinar. Bijan Bienemann is a boutique intellectual property law firm based out of Southeast Michigan. Today's webinar recording will be posted to our YouTube channel, website, and across all of our social media channels. A follow-up email will be sent out shortly with more information on how to obtain CLE credit. Once again, thank you for joining us.